We're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Online at bookedonrock.com, exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can find every episode of Booked on Rock there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms. Back on the podcast is Greg Prado. Greg has released I Love Grunge, Grunge is Dead Outtakes. This is a follow-up to his 2009 book, Grunge is Dead, The Oral History of Seattle Rock Music. As with that one, the new book is packed with quotes from the people who were there when the Seattle music scene exploded in the early 90s. Greg shares some of what's in the book in this episode. To hear a playlist of the music we discuss in this episode, make sure you head over to the show notes page. Greg, welcome back to the podcast, man. Great to see you again. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me back on. Before we get to what's in the book, let's talk about what led you to writing this book. This is I Love Grunge, Grunge is Dead Outtakes. This is a follow-up to a book that came out way back in 2009. So what led to this one? Yeah, well, what it is is the book that came out in 2009, Grunge is Dead, uh, that's been one of my uh, most popular books I think that like I've ever put out as far as sales and as far as people continually you know, telling me that they just got turned on to the book or that they keep uh, showing it to people and stuff like that. So that book, um, I put a lot of work into it back and I did it like over several years. It was like around 2005, six, seven, eight, even, I guess, at that point. And it took a while for the publisher to put it out. But um, what I'm getting at is there was so much, there were so many quotes and so much info that I had to get cut from that. And it was just sitting on a hard drive for all these years. And about a year ago, I just had a lot of time on my hands. And I was like, you know what? I wonder if any of that leftover material is actually worthwhile. So I went back, I pulled up the file. And to my surprise, I had pretty much a whole entire other book with all quotes that were not in the first book. And it's almost like a um, alternate. It's like an alternate grunge is dead kind of. It's we talk about a lot of the same topics, but there is also a lot of also cool info that wasn't in the first book as well. There's a lot so of great quotes I think if you definitely enjoy the first book, you're absolutely going to love this book as well. I yeah, think. man. A lot of great quotes in this. This is like a good deep dive type of book. Yes. If, if you're a fan of this era, you're getting some stories that, I don't know, maybe you never heard before. It is interesting to see how long this music had been bubbling before it blew up in the early 90s after reading your book. It goes all the way back to the early 80s. Bands like Black Flag and Sonic Youth would come through and they made an impact on the then young musicians in Seattle who would go on to form their own bands. The late Bill Rieflin, drummer of the Blackouts and later Ministry, had a great quote. He said, quote, nobody was concerned about being musicians as a living. People at that age just want to be in a band because it's like eating something you need to do. And that stood out to me because so different from the 80s rock mentality, right? Start a band, right. become a rock star, get famous, get the girls. What comes to mind for you from the comments that you got regarding the early 80s Seattle scene? Well, not those many uh, touring bands would really visit Seattle. I mean, like the big arena bands would. But as far as like punk bands and stuff, uh, it was such a drive from, say, L.A. all the way to Seattle that a lot of bands didn't make it. So in bands like Black Flag, Meat Puppets, The Wipers, when they actually played there, it was uh, definitely appreciated by the uh, people that lived there. And as a result, it was almost that, like I know people have said in the book that you would go from show to show and it would be the same group of people going from show to show. So you go to see one punk show, say on Monday of like a local band, it would be the same people. Then you go see like, I don't know, like Devo or something like that. It would be that same group plus also other people as well. So it was definitely a sense of uh, community you could say. And as a result, uh, again, they didn't, you know, at that point, people forget punk rock was not mainstream. There weren't like the biggest punk bands in the U S weren't really mainstream. It was like the sex pistols and may like, this is right before the clash became really popular with the uh, combat rock album. So even the clash was kind of considered not really mainstream. Like they weren't, you know, like on par with Oreo Speedwagon. like you weren't going to hear, some of like some of the songs like they're like early clash songs you weren't going to hear on the radio for instance but i think that um a lot of the people from seattle in that era 
associated with those bands and as a result inspired them to also form their own bands and that's how you got a lot of those early great grunge bands or actually proto grunge bands you could say at the time talk about this band malfunction they are the subject of chapter two in this book this was a cool clash of 90s grunge and 80s showmanship yes there's a it's a misconception and also there is some truth to it that people say that um there was a big difference between grunge and also um glam i'd say grunge had a bit more in common with the glam of the 70s where it was more kind of like proto-punk like the New York Dolls, the Stooges, Circa, like Raw Power, that they were kind of glammy at that point. Bowie, that early 70s glam had more to do with punk rather than if you think of 80s glam. That's more pretty much to how I looked at 80s glam. Most of it is just guys dressing feminine, but they're just trying to sound like Van Halen pretty much is how I kind of saw it or how it kind of how I kind of hear it. So to me, that was I, I think that a lot of those grunge bands associated with, with the 70s glam and the band Malfunction featured Andrew Wood on vocals. And he also played bass at the time. And of course, a lot of people will know that name because he eventually became the lead singer of the band Mother Love Bone, which then later turns into Pearl Jim after Andy sadly died in 1990. But yeah, but Malfunction, they sadly never put out an album, but they put out a bunch of demos and there's some YouTube bootleg type videos. But from people I speak to, they never really got properly documented. And in fact, some people who are friends with the band say that they maybe weren't as good as you remember them. But at like experiencing it at the time, they were definitely a cut above a lot of the other bands. And they were doing something a little bit different because they were doing glam metal punk type stuff. But they were playing in front of audiences that had like mohawks and stuff like that. And they and uh, also Andy Wood he had like white face he pretty much had he looked like a member of kiss but without like any of the black designs like no, like no star or anything it was just like the white face is is, is all he had so it was kind of like a kiss punk band playing for mohawk type audiences is there footage on youtube of that band yes there is some it's not pro shot or anything but you can definitely make it out that uh they were very energetic very unpredictable and uh if you compare what they were doing in the early 80s to what like mainstream rock was, like the type of rock bands that you would read about in Circus or Hit Parader, they were definitely doing something different. You cover some of the most important bands of that era, the Melvins, Green River, Soundgarden, Nirvana, Mother Love Bone, Alice in Chains, Mud Honey, and Pearl Jam. The Green River is an interesting one. Some may not know about this band, but super important to that era. Can you talk about this band, who the members were, and how, as you write, blurred the lines between punk and metal? Because some of the yes. comments you got indicated that then they went a little too metal at times, which is why they split up. Yeah, similar to um, Malfunction, Green River, uh, and you could also say Melvin's. The thing that was so great about these bands, too, is they were not one-dimensional. They were influenced by metal, punk, garage rock of the 60s, a wide, wide variety of stuff. I even hear a little bit of soul music in also some of, some of these bands, especially with like the vocals. Chris Cornell, to me, I always thought was a very soulful singer. I don't yeah. know if maybe like the average listener could hear that, but I, I could definitely hear that. And also, of course, later, Lane Staley, I thought was also very soulful in his vocals. But yeah, getting back to bands like Green River, uh, they, were a, they were a merger, or you could say, of punk and also metal. You had Stone Gossard and also Jeff Ament, which we all know from the band Pearl Jam. They were leaning more towards maybe the metal side, but that said, I know they also had punk roots, and hardcore roots so it's not as clear cut and then you had mark arm who was the singer who later went on to be the lead singer of the band mud honey and he was definitely more of the punk garage rock faction of that that band he also had steve turner briefly in that band for like i think one album and he later went on to uh be in the band mud honey with mark and he also had bruce fairweather replaced him with later turn up in mother love bone with stone and also jeff so it's it's a little bit incestuous, like a lot of these bands are kind of interwoven with each other a bit, you, you could say. Yeah, you can connect the dots between a lot of these bands. Yes. They'll end up in other bands or form, you know, like Pearl Jam is basically, yeah, it's uh, Mother Love Bone. Who was in Mother Love Bone that ended up in Pearl Jam? Stone Gossard? Yeah, Mother Love Bone. Uh, the only two two guys that were in Pearl Jam from Mother Love Bone were Jeff Ament, the bassist, and also Stone Gossard, Stone the guitarist. Gossard. Okay. Um, Bruce Fairweather, he... Uh, wasn't invited into Pearl Jam, so he wasn't in Pearl Jam, but he was in a few smaller type bands, I know. 
Greg Gilmore was the drummer. He also played in some other bands that were never as popular as Pearl Jam, but he, I believe, got a songwriting credit on a Soundgarden album, the song Never the Machine Forever, because he's friends, or was, I don't know if he still is friends, but with uh, Kim Thiel, the guitarist from Soundgarden, and uh, they, I think, were jamming one day, and they came up with the riff that later became Never the Machine, or maybe it was the drum pattern or the guitar, if I forget what, but I know he got uh, some kind of credit for that song called Never, Never the Machine Forever from Down on the Upside. Here's one that blew my mind because I had uh, Steve Turner on and he mentioned Dan Peters, the drummer, was in Nirvana for like, yes, like, I don't know, a summer, you know, it wasn't even long. Yeah, there were actually a few, like he was in, he was the drummer briefly. And then also Dale Crover from the Melvins was also briefly a really? drummer also. Just in, before uh, Dave Grohl joined. Just yes, there's a picture yep. online of, of, uh, of Dan Peters there with, you know, with Kurt and, and Chris and, uh, yeah, that's that's so cool. Yeah. And obviously, everybody's heard of Soundgarden, and mm -hmm. they've been around for a while. They formed in late 84 or early 85. That That's interesting. Megan Jasper of Sub Pop told you, quote, the first time I saw Soundgarden, they gave me a migraine headache, so I knew it was good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think right. one of the highlights of the book has to be this chapter. It offers some insight into the band's very early days. Can mm -hmm. you talk about some of the standout comments you include in the book regarding Soundgarden? Chris Cornell was on drums mm -hmm. uh, early on. Actually, he, what he did back and forth vocals, drums, I think like half the set split. Yes. Yeah, that. what it and, was, was um, people, uh, maybe to like the average uh, person doesn't know, that Soundgarden originally was a trio. It was uh, Kim Thiel on guitar, Hiro Yamamoto on bass, and then Chris not only sang, he also played drums. So it was like a Phil Collins type yeah. thing. And like on. an artsy band is what one yes, of the guys said. Exactly. And I forget who in the band likened early Soundgarden to sounding kind of like Bauhaus. They were like a more bauhaus -y or like Joy Division-ish. They were a little more gothy at the time. If you listen to on the Screaming Life album, there's a song called uh, Entering. If you listen to that, the beginning of the song actually sounds just like uh, Bela Lugosi's Dead. If you listen to both those oh, songs yeah. side by side. So uh, yeah, Soundgar Soundgarden early on was definitely more more of like a goth punk type band. But then similar to the other bands I was just mentioning, there was definitely a metal element to that what they were doing, like Sabbathy type stuff. And then also when Black Flag started slowing down their punk to kind of a slower crawl, that was also a big influence on what later became Soundgarden. Soundgarden was a very very important band and. As far as this book, you know, I think there may be more about early Soundgarden in this book than in Grunge is Dead. So if you're a fan of the early Soundgarden, which there's not that much information on, this book definitely has some pretty cool info in it, which to me is kind of a fascinating era of the band because that's when they're, uh, they, they were the first Seattle band to get signed to a major, uh, from, that, from that group of bands to get signed to a, a major label. Because I was going to say the first Seattle band get signed to a major label that's not true because Hart was from seattle right yep J uh, J jimmy hendrix was, was from seattle too so they weren't the first but they were the first grunge band and then mother love bone would have been the second band to get signed to a major label now nirvana here's another one that's interesting that i uh, got from this book kurt cobain's supposed first ever public performance brown cow when was this yes. and what did kurt do at this performance it was supposedly like a spoken word type thing where it was um it was kind of improv and him just reading, I think, over music is, is all it was. And um, yeah, I don't think there's any audio. And what's funny is Nirvana is like one of the most bootlegged bands. If you go on YouTube, there's like countless bootleg shows and stuff. But to the best of my knowledge, I, I mean, I, I haven't dug that deep, but I never heard of anyone having any, having any brown cow bootlegs. So that's I, I'm wondering if anything really uh, exists. In fact, one thing I'm always on the uh, hunt for, I like, always keeping my eye out for, Mother Love Bone, shortly before Andrew Wood died, Stone Gossard had written the music to the song Even Flow. It was called something else. It was called Dollar Short was the name. And Stone Gossard has said that he knows they, uh, they that Mother Love Bone played that live once or twice. And Andrew Wood had totally different lyrics and totally different vocal melody. And he and he always wants he's always asking, well, not always asking, but I know he's put it out there that if anyone ever has that, he would love to hear it because that's, you know, I guess oh. that's just been lost over the sands of time kind of thing. And I, I would love to hear that as well. That would be a great historic footnote type thing to hear. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. You talked to Kurt's girlfriend, Tracy Miranda, and she talks yes, about seeing she, Nirvana play their yep. first show, April 87. Yep. She actually, people don't realize that she is the photographer that took the picture that is on the cover of Nirvana Bleach. Okay. That is that is her photo. Yeah. And she was a great interview. She um, told some really good stories, again, about the early days of Nirvana, what it was like seeing them, what also it was like living with Kurt. She tells a good story about uh, they had these uh, pet, I think it was, I think it was rats. Pet, it was, I was going to say rabbit, but I'm pretty sure it was pet rats that they kept in a big cage that was multi-leveled or something like that. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like they were very big uh, pet lovers. Yeah. Is, uh, from what I could gather. Yeah. yeah. How about Nirvana playing to like, what, two, three people? Jo Jonathan Poneman of Sub Pop uh, yeah. talked about that. It was just him, the bartender. And I think that was, <laughs> I think that was yeah, it. That like, was probably two, it. Three people. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. that was the thing, too, that paints a picture of, of Nirvana when they first started weren't really that good. And but then they just they got so good so fast. Right. That's a yeah, lot of people I, talk I know about. Mark Arm from Mud Honey uh, is honest in the book. He says the first time he saw it, I think his quote is honestly, they they really weren't good when he first saw them. It was very right. noisy and very loud. But, yeah, they they got very good, very, very fast. Something happened just something clicked. Great Eddie Vedder quote, just to hear him talk about seeing Nirvana at a club is cool. Seeing them play Smells Like Teen Spirit, too. There are definitely some great quotes from Eddie Vedder that were, that were not in the first book. He talks about a, a really good quote he says is, you know, when he was younger, he would read about things like being at the what it must have been like to see Jimi Hendrix at Monterey Pop or see the Who at Woodstock or like to to be at a place when something is happening, like, or for instance, to be in San Francisco in 1967 and to actually experience like what's going on and to be in the middle of everything. And he says, and meanwhile, one day he realizes that he is actually in the middle of what's going on now, how Seattle was such a concentrate, there was such a concentrated focus in 92, 93, 94, that that was definitely the hot spot of like all of the world pretty much when it came to pop culture and music and fashion and everything i know um i once interviewed uh charlie benyante the drummer from the band uh anthrax it, it, this quote wasn't in this book it was in one of my other books i think it was the book called survival of the fittest heavy metal in the 1990s and he said it was so weird that anthrax would tour at that time and it used to be that you would go to faraway countries and for instance Fans in England would be dressed differently than, say, the fans in Portland and the fans in New York would be diff dressed differently than the fans in Paris. And he says in that time period, it was just all Seattle. It was no matter where you went in the world, whether it be, like I said, Paris, England, New York, Portland, L.A., wherever. It was all flannels. It was flannels. all Doc Martens. It was all. And, and, and I'm thinking back to it. And, you know, absolutely. I'm thinking how people were dressing like back, like back when I was back in the early nineties, like I was even wearing Doc Martens and I speak it, to my wife now and she even was wearing Doc Martens. Like yeah. everyone was definitely affected by it. You know, I worked at the mall in those mm -hmm. days and every other store clothing store had flannel. Fla you yeah, flannel. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, what's funny is, but then there's people like, you know, I honestly was wearing flannel before even grunge. So, you know, and, and I still wear flannel to, today. So, you know, certain things, it just happened to be, you know, you wear flannel when it's, you know, very cold outside, you know, it's not, but for instance, Doc Martens, I, I definitely have to thank uh, Chris Cornell for turning me on to Doc Martens. Yeah. Staying on the topic of Nirvana and Soundgarden, actually, because Kim Thiel of Soundgarden talks about the, the comments that he gave you about uh, when they heard of Kurt's death. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thiel talks about people who normally punch holes into walls are sobbing, you know, like some tough people. Right. And they're sobbing. I mean, is there a comment that really stands out to you regarding Kurt's death and the reaction that people had? Because you did talk to the DJ from KXRX, right? Scott yes. Vanderpool, he gave you a detailed account when the news hit. I thought that was mm. interesting. But anything that stands out to you from what you got from the book? Yeah, I mean, just the thing that's so weird is, you know, nowadays we think about, oh, with news, you get it like within a few seconds. But like, whereas what happened with Soundgarden was playing a show in France, I believe Paris. And they had a, a tad opening up and uh, Kurt Danielson, the bassist, somehow got a message from, I think, a member of the Screaming Trees, because uh, I think Kurt may have been married to, I think, a sister of one of the Screaming Trees members. I'm not 100 percent sure with that, but they had some kind of connection. 
And he got a message saying, yeah, hey, just to give you a heads up, something is going down here. We don't know exactly what, but, you know, I'll be in contact. And then it led to Kurt has been missing. Then it came to there's been a body discovered in Kurt's house. We don't know if it was him or someone else. And then eventually it was, yeah, it's been confirmed that it was Kurt Cobain who died. And then I believe it was the Tad guys who then waited for Soundgarden to come off stage and and they they had everyone in a room, they closed the door and they told them what happened. And um, I know that some of the guys, yeah, started to cry. And then I remember in the first book I did called Grunge is Dead, Susan Silver, who was Chris Cornell's then wife and was also Soundgarden's manager, she said eventually they got kind of belligerent and violence started destroying the room and her instructions to the tour manager were just to let them go, let them get it out because there was that was really all they could do because they were so far away from home at that point. There was nothing they could really do to mourn or anything at that point. You remember in our band Blind Melon, Shannon Hoon, mm-hmm. in the documentary, he was filming everything. He had the handheld camera. Do you remember mm-hmm. in that documentary when the day of Kurt's, uh, the news of Kurt's death arrives and Shannon Hoon is just like, he's in a, just a state of shock. Like he's yeah, that was that was the day they were, gonna, they, they, they were they were appearing on actually David Letterman and they did the song change and uh uh Shannon Hoon uh with the magic marker drew a question mark on his forehead yep yeah and uh, yeah that's in the book I of course did the earlier book about Shannon Hoon called a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other that was the first one and then I did a second book about Shannon s- simply titled Shannon which came out about a couple of years ago I remember where I was you remember where you were the day you heard Kurt died yes I do I remember I was in my cousin's house and uh, a friend came in and he said, Oh, did you hear about Kurt Cobain? And we all thought he was lying. And he said, no, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not lying. Turn on, turn on, uh, turn on uh, MTV. And we all went downstairs in the basement. And I remember Kurt Loder was uh, talking about it and they stopped playing videos. It was just Kurt Loder talking, um, you know, about the thing. And, and the thing is, I, I have to be honest. I mean, he was, you know, he was live. So he was trying to do the best he could, he could do, but, I remember one thing that he said, which like I always was like, well, I don't know if I totally agree with that. He's like, um, you know, Kurt Cobain died, and that's you know, picture Pete Townsend dying before he uh, wrote Tommy. Or, like he was making it seem like that Kurt Cobain hadn't reached his artistic peak yet. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you know, it's that's always possible. But then you think about like how many bands have you, have you, have we heard over the years that they peak and you're looking forward to the next album and it just sucks. I'm not saying that that would have happened with Nirvana, but you can't really throw out comments like that. You, know, you can't say, oh, you know, their next album would have been there or a 10 million seller. You, you can't you don't know what's going on with artists, you know, mentally or how the band is getting along. I know, for instance, Nirvana was on the edge of, of splitting up at that point. So even if Kurt survived, there's a lot of people who have said that Kurt would have just went off solo or he was looking to replace Dave Grohl. And like, there was all these crazy things that I actually talked about in this book and also the first book, Grunge is Dead. That was one thing that I remember when Kurt Loder said that, I just remember thinking, eh, I don't know if I really agree with that 100%. You yeah, know? it's funny because I remember watching the MTV uh, when they broke the news. I was yeah. I was home from college in New Haven, came home and mm-hmm. there it was. And um, I, I don't, you know, I remember just, is surprised, but then not surprised because you all the stories about his his drug habit and all this talk about him being suicidal and all that stuff. So that that yeah, it was just yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the thing yeah, the, the thing that people talk about in this book called "I Love Grunge" and also the first book, which is called "Grunge Is Dead." Um, people, I for instance, Mark Arm is very honest, and he says, you know, um, the record companies, the management, all these people. He felt that they were not looking after Kurt's best interest. It was all about just making money. Uh, Mud Honey toured with Nirvana in the fall of 1993. And uh, they said it was an awful, awful experience because the people that they surrounded themselves with weren't, uh, like I said, looking out for their best interest. It was all just about making money. How can we you know, get this tour to keep going on? How can we get as many shows and all this other stuff? Then they, then Mud Honey, a few months later, toured with Pearl Jam. And Mud Honey said they were absolutely stunned how it was the complete opposite, how Pearl Jam was run so much better. It was such a better environment. Everyone got along. Everyone looked out for each other. The management and the band, everyone was had everyone in their own best interest or was looking out for their best interest. Yeah. So it's just funny how 
the press made it seem like, you know, Nirvana is this more organic punk rock, true to their roots type thing, whereas Pearl Jam was this fabricated professional thing. But then Marani says that it was absolutely the opposite. I remember Steve, uh, Steve Turner said here that uh, people that were working for Pearl Jam then are still working for them now. Yes. It was that yep. strong of a of a family right. unit there. Yeah. Yep. Chapter seven covers one of those standout what could have been bands. And you were mentioning Mother Love Bone before. Andy Wood was the singer. Stone Gossard on guitar. Jeff Ament on bass. And then you mentioned Bruce Fairweather also. He was on guitar. And you write, quote, many figured Mother Love Bone was going to be the band to introduce grunge to the masses before tragedy sadly intervened. What did people have to say about you know, why they felt that this band was going to be huge? And what was it that this band and Annie Wood had that stood out from the rest? What's funny is I remember Rip Magazine at the time I first read about Mother Love Bone. It was actually after Andrew Wood died. So it had been in the summer or fall of 1990. And Rip Magazine was just totally going off on this band, saying they were it was such a tragedy because this band was the greatest band and or or, or could have been such a great band. And um, as I probably discussed in one of my previous appearances, my favorite all-time rock band is Queen. And they compared what they were doing to Queen. And they said that also Andrew Wood referenced Freddie Mercury and some of the lyrics and things like that. So that totally caught my interest. And I ran out and bought the record, bought the CD, I remember, when I was at college. And what's funny is at first it didn't hit me. I just, you know, I was just so fed up with, with horrible hair metal and glam metal at that point that I couldn't see that it was different from so, from a lot of the glam metal at the time. So I just kind of passed it off. But then later when I got really into Pearl Jam, I went back and heard it with like a different set of years. And then, and then I could totally hear it for what it was. And what it was, was they looked kind of glammy, but uh, Andrew Wood was a larger than life character. And he was drawing more from the 70s type glam, not, you know, like Poison or Warrant or any of those garbagey bands. He was pulling more from early Queen, early 70s T-Rex, Bowie. In fact, you could really say that the most obvious thing is he was doing piano things, which, which none of the hair metal bands or glam metal bands of the 80s were doing. Like I said earlier, it was to me, to my ears, they were just doing fourth rate Van Halen ripoff type stuff is like all that they, they were pretty much doing. Whereas uh, Andrew Wood was trying to write epics on the piano and he was pulling in like Zeppelin type things, but it, it wasn't like a bad Zeppelin ripoff because you think back to the late 80s that they had you had all those horrible zeppelin ripoff fans but hearing them now i definitely hear what they were doing was something interesting and and different and that would have been i would have been curious to hear what they would have gone on to do but again then we wouldn't have pearl jam so i guess everything happens for a reason the book done rock podcast will be back after this greg yeah. prado here to talk about his brand new book i love grunge grunge is dead outtakes and andy wood died march of 1990 heroin overdose you spoke to a Seattle journalist, Dawn Anderson, and she said Andy had gotten clean, mm -hmm. but then when he went back to doing drugs, he went back just as hard as before rather than building it up. And a lot of times that happens. So when you go back that strong, it's too much for your body to handle. Um, you know, but here's the what if question for you. I mean, if Andy Wood doesn't die, mm -hmm. how different would we be looking back on the 90s? You just mentioned no Pearl Jam. That's true. We, we, we wouldn't have Pearl Jam. Mother Love Bone could have, I think, appealed to like the hair metal, glam metal uh, band, like fans of those bands. So in fact, I remember there's video footage of Andrew Wood from like 89, 90, where he's talking about like, you know, give us any tour, give us a tour like with Warrant. We'll open up for Warrant because he's saying that, you know, Warrant, you, you could just like when you're on those types of tours, you could just say anything to a to an arena full of people and they'll just like cheer back kind of like, you know, blindly. So it would have been interesting to see if uh, Mother Love Bone could have toured with some of those bands, if they would have been able to fit in and maybe, you know, who knows, maybe they would have been more of a, a bridge from the glam metal of the eighties to the grunge of 91, 92, you know, that's it was the word. Yeah. A because, bridge. Because, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause because if, I'm, I'm sure you remember how, it was just like one day MTV was playing Poison, the next day it was over and they were playing Nirvana. Yes, it was just boom. Yeah, yeah. it bridged the gap. That might have been, that might have been the case. Yeah, right. and, and and what would the '90s be like without 
Lane Staley, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if he didn't live as long as he did, because he could have been gone soon too. I mean, he, although he got into the, I think he got into the, to the heroin kind of late in the game. I think it was more towards like the mid nineties. I think if I recall correctly that yeah, I think he started uh, getting said, into it. Yeah. I got, I want to interview Jerry Cantrell. He that talks about it in this book or the previous grunge book that uh, they dabbled a bit, but it wasn't until European tour in 1990 or 91 that they right. all tried heroin for the first time. And yeah, that was the big, you know, it's like sad how some people can experiment and it's nothing than there's some people that just try it once and they're just hooked and they can never get off it. And sadly, that's what happened with Lane Staley. He just could never get off heroin, whether if it's just him, if it was like a mental thing or it's just if it's a physical thing, you know, you could say addiction is almost impossible to figure out because each person is built so different. What a voice. What a friggin' voice, man, Lane yeah. Staley. And he made it Absolutely. to 2002. I mean, he did make, he lived into the 2000s. So he did, but yeah, he was virtually a hermit from, yeah. say, the late 90s through his death. He would just pretty much stay in his apartment, his uh, condo, and wouldn't, I don't think he'd really come out, especially the last few years, would very rarely ever come out. And um, I know Susan Silver said that uh, he physically, his appearance changed so much that you wouldn't have even recognized him, that he oh, looked man. very old. Yeah. Towards the end. So, Jesus. yeah, it's sad. Now you, you spoke to his mother, Nancy Lane McCallum. I did. I uh, interviewed her at length for the first book. I only used one quote in this book. I right. The middle of, name it, change. You you quoted her on him changing yes, his middle exactly. name. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That, that was Yeah, because I remember that quote for the first book. I, I, I wanted to include it really badly. And then I didn't include it for some reason. And that's one quote I've, I always regretted not including. So this time I had to include it just to get it out there, which is. Maybe I won't give it away that why Lane changed his middle name, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a connection there. I guess you'd be surprised to find <laughs> out. But how did there you is. how did you get a hold of her? Honestly, I forget because it was so long. Like the interview with Hart took place in like 2007-ish. It's been so long. I really don't remember. But Yeah. What was she yeah, like? But- she, oh, she was very sweet, very nice. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, very, very, very nice woman. Of course, you feel you feel so bad for what she's had to have gone through when you, you know, when you're a mother who loses her son. That's the um, thing. I mean, the book humanizes these guys because they're like rock gods, and you realize they had a mom and dad. They got right. parents that that was her little boy, you know. Yeah. And, and then he goes on to become a huge rock star, and, and you know the, the the tragedy of it all. Yeah, that, that's and there's, and, you spoke and there's to also Shannon Hoon's mom discons- too, right? Well, Shannon Hoon's well, you spoke to Shannon yes, Hoon's mom too. I did, yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, there's a misconception um, that I often read or kind of I kind of I kind of kind of feel from people that if you become famous and rich, then that solves all your problems, and uh, that's not true. I mean, I know Gene Simmons, I think, has said that that you know, it obviously worked for him, but. If you are, say, if you are addicted to something, you get more money than you may just put all your money towards your addiction. Or if something horrible happened to you in the past, just because you get money that doesn't fix you, it could only make it worse. So, you know, just, you know, people all have the same problems and just becoming, fam- you, know, you think of it this way too. If you have social anxiety, if you're suddenly very famous and you have, stalkers and people always following you around it's only going to make it's only going to make that worse for you so absolutely you know, just, yeah each, uh, person is different let's go back to pearl jam eddie vetter talking about seeing mud honey this is when he was in a band called bad radio and yes. this is actually the very first quote to start off chapter 10 mm-hmm. by the way is is that a coincidence 10 yeah, oh, yeah you know what i didn't think of that actually thanks for pointing that out that just happened. Okay. That's, that that's how it turned out but yeah yeah, yeah. pearl jam 10 <laughs> Good eye, so, good eye, good eye. Yeah, he goes into detail about his his trek from San Diego to Seattle and how it all leads to the formation of Pearl Jam. And and that follows with comments from guys like Allison Chain's guitarist Jerry Cantrell, mm. who remembers when they brought Eddie into the band yeah. and they formed Mookie Blaylock later to uh, later to become Pearl Jam. What was the overall impression that musicians from that scene thought of Pearl Jam and Eddie when they first saw them perform? Did well, like it's funny. Right I interviewed someone that used to work for Kelly Curtis's management company, and that's who is Pearl Jam's manager to this day. I'm pretty sure. And uh, at the time, they hooked up with Eddie, and they played one of the first couple of shows. And Eddie Vedder 
uh, was not he w- his back was turned to the audience. It was not the Eddie Vedder that we all know, or even the Eddie Vedder that you'd see in the Even Flow video where he's climbing in the rafters and diving the audience and everything like that. He was still a little shy or still kind of feeling his way. And funny enough, the person that worked for Kelly at that point said there was actually some internal talk about is Eddie Vedder the right singer for this band? They were thinking, I don't know, should we give how much of a chance are we giving him before we have to look at, you know, somewhere else? So if he uh, kept turning his back to the audience, who knows, maybe he wouldn't even lasted long enough to make an album with Pearl Jam. But luckily he did turn around and we got Pearl Jam with Eddie Vedder. Yeah, and they're doing okay. They're still around. They are. (laughs) struggling right yes <laughs> chapter 12 insight into how the residents and bands of seattle coped with all of the unexpected attention that the region got in the 90s it seemed like a mixed reaction like some thought it was really cool and they're proud of the fact that seattle was getting recognition but then there were those who were so put off by it that they literally moved out of seattle standout comments from that chapter for you well i know jeff Ament- fled he said as soon as he what's funny is he left he was from montana originally he left montana because he couldn't he just didn't like there was not enough i guess he was like the only fan that like the only person that like punk rock or one of the few people so he moved to the seattle area to get around more art people like artsy people and more like like-minded people and then once that happened he said he just fled right back to montana because he couldn't take it anymore with just the being such a focus at that point commercialized commercial yeah or not like so much uh he he tells a story i think it was in the first book grunge is dead he talks about that pearl jim was on tour so much he couldn't really get a feel for how much pearl jim had blown up because of like mtv playing their videos and everything and he once had a break from tour and he was in seattle and he just went to like his neighborhood cafe just to get coffee and sit down and read a paper and he said suddenly everything had changed like everyone was just staring at him and you know, he said su- suddenly when they were on tour at that point, went back on tour, th- the band couldn't go from just the backstage door to the actual tour bus. It was impossible that, you know, like, just with so many people waiting and trying to get their autographs and stuff that was like that quick. And yeah. uh, that must have been crazy. That 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 has to screw with your head. But oh, but you really pre- have to give Pearl Jam credit because they're the only band that really was able to weather the storm and came out of it. You know, they they, they didn't go you know, you look at people like Chris Cornell, Lane Staley, Kurt Cobain, Shannon Hoon, we talked about earlier, Scott Weiland, you could say fame definitely had a bad, fame had a detrimental effect on all of them. With MTV, everybody, you recognize every single member of the band. Yeah. You know, you could be maybe back in the day, you could be, you know, the bassist or a keyboardist for a band, and you could kind of walk in and out of a room and nobody would know. Back in the days of, say, Super Tramp, you could go into a yeah. grocery store and people would know who the hell you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, hello. I'm I'm the keyboardist for Super Tramp. Yeah. yeah like, right. uh, yeah. well, that that was yeah. the thing. Uh, Kiss, the guys in Kiss used to talk. Like Ace Fra- right. Fraley used to get actually a little a little pissed off because when he would show yeah. up, what did he show up at a concert once and um, and he's like, I'm Ace Fraley, you know, of Kiss. Right. Like, yeah. Right. Fuck off. Right. Because <laughs> they, they never saw him without makeup. <laughs> right. And, and I also remember I once read a pretty good interview with Brian Johnson from the band ACDC. He said he once was at an ACDC show and he left and tried to get back in and they stopped and they, they didn't recognize him. And because <laughs> I guess it was when he was still new in the band. Right. So he, he eventually did get back in. But he said from that point on, when, whenever he was backstage or like leaving, he, he would always try to wear something a little flashy, like a scarf or something, just to, to <laughs> maybe set him apart from just, you know, the regular concert goers. Of the Look time. like a rock star. <laughs> right. Chapter 13 titled Odds and Ends, and you write a variety of grunge-related topics for your reading pleasure. You include comments mm-hmm. regarding the word grunge. Where did it come from? So let's get into this. It was the former yep. assistant for Pearl Jam manager, Kelly Curtis. I think it's, is it Carisha? Krisha, yes. Krisha Augurat. Yes. And she had a quote. She said, grunge to me, I always thought was a combination of garage and dirge. That was what it meant to me. Kind of a stooges garage thing. But the quotes that you include indicate that they're really not sure where this, this comes from. Didn't it start with Mark Arm, Mud Honey? It was like back in 81. He called his band Mr. Epp in the calculations, yeah. pure grunge, right? Well, supposedly, I, I, I believe... People have said the first time that they've seen that they saw the word grunge being used may have been in Cream Magazine in the early eight, excuse me, early 70s. It may have been Lester Bangs, but I'm not 100 percent sure. 
I'm pretty sure that was something to do with cream or some kind of magazine. I think used the word grunge. Interesting. And then, and then from there, you don't, uh, it's, it's hard to put your finger on it somewhere along the way. It was, yeah, I mean, I, I do kind of like the uh, description that it's a mixture of, of garage and also dirge. That does sound kind of, yeah. Weird. But then I remember like, I remember reading quotes from Ben Shepard, the bassist from uh Soundgarden, saying that, they ripped off everything from the band Black Sabbath. I remember that was his famous quote. He would say as like a joke, which if you listen to early Black Sabbath, it does sound a bit like uh, Soundgarden. And then on top of it, Charlie Benyante, who I just mentioned before, the drummer of Anthrax, has said that Chris Cornell always reminded him of Ronnie James Dio and also David Coverdale from back when he was singing with Purple, Deep Purple. Mm. And if you listen to what Ronnie James Dio is doing on the Heaven and Hell album, there definitely are some... Chris Cornell screams and stuff. So it's hard to pinpoint it, you know? Yeah. There's the Sabbath influence. I definitely hear, definitely hear it. Sabbath. And there's also certain black flag albums yeah. where they start slowing down. There's an album called my war. I think it was the second side of that album where they suddenly slowed it down. So it was like, it was pretty much just like sound garden. It sounded like. Yeah, I even so heard it, somebody throw in Aerosmith as an influence that like the early, Early, early Aerosmith. Aerosmith. It, you know, it's it, it's like it's that so gritty funny street how, how sound. Aeros yeah, it's funny how Aerosmith influenced so many different. I mean, Guns and Roses listed them as an influence. Nirvana lists them lists them as an influence. There's so many different, you know, wide variety. Soundgarden, I know, has listed them as an influence. You know, and then of course all the '80s hair metal bands like Cinderella loved Aerosmith. So yes. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how, how many people that they, they've influenced. In fact, I know even for a fact that a lot of like the thrash band, I know that James Hetfield was a big Aerosmith, uh, Aerosmith fan. And also oh, I Cliff didn't know Burton. that. Yeah. yeah Cliff, okay. Cliff Burton was a big Aerosmith fan. Yeah. And then some previously unpublished interviews in the book. Who can listeners look forward to hearing from in this chapter? And, and what are some highlights? Yeah. What, well, what it was. Yeah. There's a chapter. It's just, it's just simply titled 2017 Interviews. What happened was in 2017, I tried getting back in contact with the publisher of Grunge is Dead to see if they wanted to do a, a expanded edition. Because, you know, this book has been a steady seller and it's still popular. And that was sadly right after Chris Cornell died. So I figured, you know, this book has been out for so long. It's, you know, been reissued a, a few times. Why don't we do a updated or a new expanded version? Maybe we could change the cover. We can add some new interviews. So I just happened to, around that time, interview Jeff Ament of Pearl Jam, Chad Channing, who was the drummer of Nirvana Bleach, and also Robert DeLeo, the bassist of Stone Temple Pilots, which interestingly, I did not interview any of the Stone Temple Pilot members for the first grunge book, but I figured, you know, it would be good to, to hear what he had to say. Cause I remember at the time they kept lumping Stone Temple Pilots in with all of the grunge bands at the time. So yeah. I'd be curious to hear what he had to say. So to make a long story short, I did not get the okay from the publisher. So those three interviews just sat on my hard drive again all these years. And then when I started putting this book together, I thought, oh, wait, now's the opportunity to pull out those quotes and put them in here. So that's what I did. And uh, it was, like I said, it was right after when, you know, Chris passed away. So Jeff Ament was kind enough to talk about what was going, you know, he was still processing uh, Chris dying because that was when he had just worked with Chris in the Temple of the Dog reunion, which was 2016, I believe, late 2016. So, you know, he was definitely trying to process that. And that was also shortly after when Scott Weiland died. So it was interesting to hear what uh, Robert had to say from Stunt Tumble Pilots about, you know, Scott passing away as well. And that was right after Nirvana was uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which Chad Channing attended. So it was good to also uh, hear what Chad had to say. Some of his memories of crossing paths with uh, Dave Grohl that night and everything like that was pretty cool to hear. Have you seen Stone Temple Pilots now with the new singer, Jeff? I, I've Gutt? just seen is videos, it? but uh, he is very similar to Scott, isn't he? Holy shit. Yeah. I was listening to a, a podcast and they were they have it on video too, and they were playing clips. And I mean, it, it, but not, not in a good way. I mean, it's like if, you, if you're a Stone Temple Pilots fan and you want to see the band like it was mm -hmm. then, yeah, then you, you'll be happy because it's not, he's not, He's not trying to to be his own guy. I mean, he even moves like him and sings. I was like going to say, I recently Jeff Gutt, was right? Oh, Isn't that his name? G U T T. Could yes. You, yeah. 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 They released an I album. Remember, yeah. Because recently, I was like, oh, you know, I'm curious to hear what they sound like with the new singer, and I watched it, and yeah, I was impressed that it sounds just like they used to. But 
it's and I'm not saying it's to to be a jerk. It's just honestly, if you don't agree with me, you can watch it for yourself. They pretty much have like a Stone Temple Pilots tribute band singer, right? Scott Wyland is what it is. I mean, it, he looks like him, moves like him, sounds just like him. You know, that's interesting because yeah, you could go one way or the other when you have to replace you know, a singer in a band. Right. Do you want do you want to have do you want to have that singer be entirely different mm-hmm. and go go a different route or is it not worth the risk and just let's have somebody in there like a cover uh, like a tribute band type singer yeah I, I, maybe it depends on when it happens because like when ACDC gets Brian Johnson they yeah. certainly were at that they were not at that point where they're playing on their legacy they they still had something to prove Van right. Allen with Sammy you know, I Iron think it's Maiden. different for Stone Temple. Yeah, for Stone Temple yeah. Pilots now, I think to try to go in a different direction really wouldn't be beneficial for them to sell tickets. I guess I don't know. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. The Book Done Rock Podcast will be back after this. Let's wrap up last chapter, chapter fifteen, mm-hmm. and it is titled "Quotes from Elsewhere." So, what's in this chapter? And what are yeah, your so, personal favorite quotes? Because I have my Yeah. So what it is, is besides favorite. writing books, I also write for a wide variety of sites and also publications. I write for uh, Song Facts, Brave Words, Vintage Guitar Magazine, Consequence of Sound. And from years back, I used to write for Rolling Stone and Billboard and Guitar World. So I've pretty much named a publication or website of the past uh, 20 years. And I'm somehow connected. Not, I mean, I've probably did something for them or i wrote for an editor that later was at that site or magazine or whatever but um again when i was putting this book together i realized you know over the years uh, with all these interviews i've done with all these people there's been countless times where some kind of grunge topic came up whether ta- being talked about whether we were discussing kirk Cobain. i was once interviewing kirk hammett from the band metallica and he was telling me how he crossed paths with kurt cobain back in the day and how Kurt Cobain was a huge Metallica fan, particularly the Ride the Lightning album and also the Kill 'Em All album. And he told me a great story about that. So I included that. And then also I just recently, a few months back, interviewed Jeff Ament again. So Jeff Ament. Oh, I love this. Featured, yeah. Jeff Ament's featured throughout this book. And I got to ask him some questions about uh, certain Pearl Jam songs. He talks I love about that. the creation. And what's good, it's not the most famous Pearl Jam songs. Right. Um, and he, Give some really cool insight into how these songs were constructed and things like that. And he also talks, he talks about how he came up with the muted harmonic in the song Even Flow. Yeah. Which I found yeah. very fascinating. And the crank call from Kurt Cobain from uh, Evan Dando from the Lemonheads. Evan Heads. Dando talks about being crank. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's not many people that can make that claim that they were prank called by right. Kurt Cobain, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then on the other side of that is the, the sad story of the, the, the actor in the Pearl Jam Jeremy video. Yes. You talked to the director of that video, Mark Pellington, and also Chris Cornell from 2015. Yes, that was great. Yeah, also, Mark Lanigan. I, I sadly interviewed Mark Lanigan just a few months before he passed. So, yeah, I, I was able to put that in there. And um, Gary Lee Connor from The Screaming Trees. I, I included yep. some, of, some of his quotes. And, um, yeah, I, I do think... You know, what, what I say in this book's intro is if you are not familiar with Grunge is Dead, I, I recommend reading that book first, then doing then then reading this book. This book is a perfect companion because Grunge is Dead is more chronologically set up, whereas this one is not strict chronological. We're going like a chapter will be just about Soundgarden, a chapter will be just about Nirvana, whereas Grunge is Dead, there is you, you go chronologically. So you'll get like in the eighties, some sound garden, the nineties, some sound garden, you know, it's like all spread out as it's going year by year. Yeah. Another must read, by the way, I don't think I've ever asked you, what is your first ever published article? I started. Okay. Um, I mean, were you in high school, junior high? Was no, it college? No, 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 no. What it was, was, um, I was, <laughs> I took a job as a customer service rep for a music magazine, which I'm not going to say the name because I wasn't treated particularly kindly by them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what it is, is I took a job as a customer service rep with them and I saw, how, and, and I loved music. Music was my favorite thing. And I saw how easy it was to be a writer from just some of the writers that were there. So I uh, begged my, my boss at the time to please let me try writing and they said, okay, they gave me like one or two bullshit album reviews. 
And then I, I liked it so much. I wanted to, I, I wanted to do that more than just being a customer service representative. And my boss made it very clear that I was not going to be able to write for them. So I said, you know what? Adios. And I quit. That was right when the internet was starting to boom and really kind of take flight. So I was able to get my foot in the door with some publications and all, and also magazines. So to answer your question, there was a local free music paper here on Long Island called the Island Ear. And I was able to, it didn't pay anything, but I took it just to get uh, articles published. And I know some of the, one of the earliest interviews I ever did was Rick Ocasek from the band, The Cars. I know that. Ah, cool. So that was one of the first ones. And then from there, I cold called All Music, which was kind of just launching their own website at that point. They were pretty much known as just like having a, these big thick books, which are just all like album reviews. And I just called them and uh, they let me start to do album reviews for them. And if you look up my name to this, I, I haven't done album reviews for them in many years. I do, I still do interviews for them, but I've done so many album reviews for them. Like still to this day, I have people saying, oh yeah, I came across this uh, Living Color album review. You're all I, over oh, it. Yeah, I wrote that like back in 1999. Or yes, yes, you're all over like that, that website. Yeah. Yeah, wow, so. that yeah, that that's cool. Now, if, one last question: anybody that you've been wanting to interview for a long time, you just haven't been able to. You've gotten close, and just hasn't happened. Yeah, Brian May would be great. Oh um, yeah, yeah, just because he's one of my favorite guitarists, he would be great to interview. Um, Roger Taylor, did you ever interview? Never uh, interviewed any of the Queen guys. Okay. Never interviewed any of the Queen guys, and that that would be great to interview. Also, never interviewed any of the main ACDC guys, never interviewed Angus or Brian Johnson. Uh, the closest I got to ACDC was I've interviewed Simon Wright, who was the drummer in the 80s. Yeah. In fact, the first time I ever saw ACDC. No, I take that back. The only two times I ever saw ACDC, the Flick of the Switch tour and the Who Made Who tour. He was the drummer. And I told him that he got a pretty big kick out of that. Yeah. He's on Fly yeah. the Wall, too. Yes. Think, yeah. 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 But, I'm, but I'm just saying personally, I, I just and he was also on Blow Up Your Video. But yeah. me personally, I just saw those two tours. But that's and also, cool. uh, Joan Jett would be good to interview. Wow, I'm surprised um, you haven't had Joan Jett. Yeah, Joan, yeah, and also yeah, uh, probably James James uh, Hetfield would be good to interview. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they're um, coming. I think also Howard Stern would probably be pretty fun, right? Yeah. That'd yeah. be a good one. He, well, I you get, anyone else. Um, you get to interview Stuttering John. <laughs> yeah, I did. Also, and he had you on his show. He did, he did. And also, <laughs> David Lee Roth, that would probably be kind of weird, though. But, I mean, I would absolutely do it, though. I would do yeah, it. You'd have but, to, uh, I don't know. Is he playing with a uh, full deck nowadays? I, yeah. I, it's, it's, <laughs> he's tough to keep up with. He is. He tough, is. Yeah, but I, I would absolutely interview him and I would absolutely tell him how I'm grateful for his music. Honestly. Hell yeah. I mean, Hell yeah. He, yeah. I, I know he's uh, a bit of a larger than life character, but you have to give him credit where credit's due. The body of work he created with Van Halen is pretty much second to none. And he had such a huge part of that. Amen to that, man. Diamond Dave. And, you know, we're talking grunge. A lot of those grunge bands love Van Halen. Like Pearl Jam plays Van Halen tunes. They play yes. Talk About Love. They play. Yep. I love grunge. Grunge is dead outtakes. It's out now, and it is available wherever books are sold. So you can go to Amazon, all the usual places, right? Yes, and it's available as paperback, hardcover, Kindle, and also Audible, audio. So you can hear, and, and it's narrated by me. Yes, I love it. I love and, it. And I always say that you could always hear my wonderful Long Island accent narrating <laughs> the whole book to you. Where can people find you online if they want to reach well, out to you? Yeah, well, I would say uh, as far as my books, and would you believe I've done over 40 books at this point? Wow. Man, I'm so tired. Can I just take a nap? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best place for people to find my books, Amazon. Just go on Amazon and do a search for Greg Prado. That's, that, that's really the best way. But um. I'd say go to twitter.com slash Greg Prater Writer. The only problem with that is, is it still called Twitter or is it called X at this point? Yeah, what's up with that? What's X? I don't know. I mean, are they phasing it to become X? I, or I, I, don't I don't know. I'm seeing X there and I know I've heard something about it. I'm like, oh, Christ. Yeah. I yeah, but know, you but are yeah, on Twitter. Twitter.com slash Greg Prater Writer, I think is probably the best uh, way to. Yeah, because on there, what I do is um, I have a link there. Is that they, it's, a, it's a pinned link that you can um, get all my books the Amazon link. And then also if you scroll down, you'll see all my latest articles and interviews. And also I want to put out there, I'm also on Cameo now. I saw that. Yeah. So if anyone wants to hire me to do a uh, message or if anyone, if, if you know anyone that bought my books and is a fan of my books, I will definitely do a uh, goofy Cameo thing. 
I love it. I, I saw that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah so. cool, man. So before I let you go, though, prediction, your Jets with oh. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. What's the, uh, what I mean, will be their record and how far will they go? No, it's impossible to say their record. Absolutely okay. impossible. Uh, I'll say I'm going to be I'm going to think positive and say they will make the playoffs. OK, if, of course, all goes according to plan. I mean, of course, I'm trying to think, well, no, you know what the, the question, the real question should be what at what game does Aaron Rodgers suffer? The inevitable season ending injury is what. Yes. Be, right? Yes. And of yes. course, in, and of course, in true Jets fashion, they don't have a serviceable veteran quarterback to back him up in case that happens. Right. I so, know. He goes down, the season goes down the toilet, and that's it. That's a typical Jets season, right? I'm banking on Kenny Pickett for my Steelers. I'm I'm liking yeah. him as the quarterback. I'm liking him as the QB. The future. Speaking of, the of which, Steelers. if there are any Jets fans out there, I've done two Jets books. One is called yeah. Sack Exchange, and then the other one I count down the top 100 Jets top debacles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you, you, you can go on Amazon and look that up. So I do mostly rock stuff. I've done a few uh, sports. Uh, you have. Well. You have. Yeah. All right, Greg. Thanks. Thanks, man. As always, this is awesome. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back on again soon. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. That's it. It's in the books.